Welcome back to this latest installment of the 12 Days in March review series for Step 1. This is Karen Malour here again to introduce the grand finale of our three-part series on the brachial plexus. In today's video, we'll cover the last two terminal branches of the brachial plexus you'll need to be familiar with for Step 1, the median and ulnar nerves. The median nerve derives from the medial and lateral cords of the brachial plexus. These cords innervate the muscles of the anterior compartment of the arm. The median nerve is comprised of nerve fibers from C5 to T1. This nerve often gives students grief, but in the next few slides I'll try to simplify it so nothing comes as a surprise on test day. The median nerve travels medially along the upper arm and crosses the elbow alongside the brachial artery. It enters the anterior compartment of the forearm via the cubital fossa. The median nerve then goes on to enter the hand via the carpal tunnel before terminating into its terminal branches. The median nerve innervates the majority of the muscles in the anterior forearm and some of the intrinsic hand muscles. In the anterior forearm, the median nerve is responsible for the majority of muscles involved in pronation of the forearm and flexion of the wrist. As the median nerve goes on to enter the hand, it innervates the so-called loaf muscles, L for the two lateral lumbricals, O for the opponent's pollicis muscle, A for abductor pollicis brevis, and F for flexor pollicis brevis. The names aren't super high yield here, but remember the OAF or OAF muscles together are called the thenar muscles, and the median nerve innervates all of them to help abduct, oppose, and flex the thumb. The two lateral lumbricals are innervated by the median nerve. The role of the lumbricals can best be remembered by thinking of trying to hold a P between your fingers. To do this, your lumbricals work to help flex your MCP and extend your IP joints. So the median nerve helps the two lateral lumbrical muscles perform these actions on the index and middle fingers. The median nerve supplies sensation to the skin overlying the thenar eminence and the palmar and superior dorsal aspect of the lateral three and a half digits as seen above in blue. Let's talk about what happens when the median nerve gets injured. This can get tricky depending on the site of injury. Proximal median nerve injuries are often seen in the setting of supracondylar fractures. Injuries to the median nerve proximally will cause weakness with flexion, flexion of the wrist, flexion of the second and third digits via the lumbricals, and finally, flexion as well as opposition of the thumb, which classically produces a deficit known as ape's hand due to the inability to oppose the thumb. Recall the median nerve's close proximity to the brachial artery. So a supracondylar fracture may also affect this artery. Do you recall which other nerve runs in close proximity to a blood vessel that we discussed in a prior video? Bingo! The axillary nerve runs in close proximity to the humeral posterior circumflex artery. Injury to the surgical neck of the humerus can damage this vessel. Returning to the median nerve, proximal injuries will classically produce the so-called hand of benediction. This will be seen when the patient is asked to make a fist. Due to nerve injury, the patient will be unable to flex the thumb or the second or third digits, leaving the hand resembling that of a pope or preacher passing along blessings. Distal median nerve injuries are most often seen secondary to lacerations at the wrist or with fractures of the lunate bone in the hand. In distal median nerve injuries, because the nerve is injured distal to all of the forearm musculature, these muscles are largely unaffected. Further, wrist flexion is otherwise normal. Distal injuries instead will classically produce a claw at rest. The median claw results from a loss of function of the lumbrical muscles. This results in an exaggerated hyperextension of the first, second, and third MCPs and flexion of the DIP and PIP of the second and third digit. While lumbrical weakness is also seen in proximal lesions, the deficits are best appreciated when the patient is asked to make a fist, not while at rest. You may also see thenar atrophy in distal median nerve injuries. Median nerve injuries will classically result in sensory loss to the palmar aspect and the superior dorsal aspect of the lateral three and a half digits and the thenar eminence in the hand as seen in the distribution above. The median nerve provides no sensory innervation to the upper arm or forearm, just the hand. So let's recap. The median nerve will help flex the forearm and move the thumb. 
it provides both motor and sensory innervation to the lateral three and a half digits as well as the lateral two lumbricals. You'll see a claw with distal injuries and the hand of benediction with proximal injuries. That leaves us with the last of the high yield terminal branches, the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve contains fibers from the C8 to T1 spinal roots of the brachial plexus. The ulnar nerve descends down the medial aspect of the upper arm and at the elbow passes posteriorly to the medial epicondyle before entering the forearm. At the forearm, it travels alongside the ulnar artery and goes on to enter the hand via the ulnar canal. The ulnar nerve provides motor innervation to the two anterior medial flexors of the forearm, specifically the flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial portion of the flexor digitorum profundus. Remember, the remaining flexors in the forearm are innervated by which nerve? Yes, the median nerve. The ulnar nerve will also innervate the hypothenar muscles of the palm, the third and fourth lumbricals, and all the interosseous muscles of the hand. The ulnar nerve provides sensation to the dorsal and palmar aspect of the medial one and a half fingers. Injury to the ulnar nerve is most often seen with compression at the medial epicondyle or a hook of hamate fracture. Proximal ulnar nerve injuries at the elbow will result in weakness in wrist flexion due to forearm muscle weakness and loss of flexion at the fourth and fifth digits due to lumbrical weakness. You will also lose adduction and abduction of all fingers resulting in a patient being unable to keep a piece of paper in between their index finger and thumb. You may also see hypothenar wasting. A distal ulnar nerve injury at the level of the wrist, like seen in a hook of hamate fracture, will present similarly to proximal injuries, but patients will classically have a claw hand at rest. This is again due to an exaggerated hyperextension of the fourth and fifth MCP and flexion of the DIP and PIP. Finger adduction and abduction will also be lost because the distal injuries will also result in a loss of interossei muscle strength. The key takeaway here is that distal lesions will present with a claw at rest, while proximal lesions will not. So let's sum it up. The ulnar nerve innervates the two medial flexors of the forearm. All the other stuff is the median nerve, and the sensation for the medial one and a half digits on both sides of the hand. The ulnar nerve innervates all the interosseous muscles of the hands, so problems abducting or adducting the second to fifth digits is an ulnar nerve issue. Like we saw with median nerve injuries, distal damage to the ulnar nerve results in a claw hand at rest. And that's all she wrote, folks. So let's put it all together. This slide serves as a quick recap for all the high yield takeaway points for each of the branches of the brachial plexus we've discussed in this video series. And that about wraps it up, my friends. On behalf of Dr. Howard Sachs, his cat Lily, and me, Kieran Malour, thank you so much for watching this video and tuning into our three-part series as we try to demystify the brachial plexus. We hope you found it useful and wish you all the best as you study for step one. This is Kieran Malour, signing off.